Yeah, I'm going to wait for you guys to catch up over here. It's the new studio. We have the new. We just downloaded all the OBS software for YouTube, and we couldn't figure out even how to how to turn a video on. We tried to do a live with the new OBS system that synced with our that synced with our new uh, microphones, and nothing worked. So I just ran over here to my studio. Matt lives super close to me now. Sorry about that, guys. Hopefully, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna have to we're probably just gonna have to take a crash course in IT trying to figure out that OBS system. It's the one everybody uses, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure it out. <clears throat> All right. Wait for wait for more people to catch up. See some new names in here, and of course, definitely see all the OGs. Hey, Jay, Tampa, Florida. Yeah. Joey, you might need to exit the app and come back in. For the rest of you, how's my audio? That's good. Yeah, that's... That's kind of disheartening. Had the whole studio set up. We're ready to go. Got the new software. Got the new, we got all the new, all the new hardware for the microphones to make them work right. Everything. We, op we opened up the live video and the OBS system took over our YouTube controls with a whole new, a whole new operating system that we were both absolutely unfamiliar with. Have no idea how even to, how even to start the live stream inside the OBS system. That's some. I'm pretty sure there's other content creators that can educate me on that. And so uh, that's 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 gonna have to be Matt. Matt's gonna figure that one out because we were both bewildered. So we deleted the OBS system completely from my laptop so we could get back into the live, and it wouldn't even let us access YouTube anymore. It's like wow. So I grabbed all my things and ran right around the corner. Well, it's more than that. Out of his door all the way down down a, a, a back road and then all the way behind my property there's a long fence and then I have a side gate which fortuitously was just put there I don't know why we I don't know why JR and I built that side gate there but now it's very useful that Matt moved into a house directly behind me so hey over 400 people in the chat that's pretty good that's that's pretty good lately we've been had we've been we've been uh enjoying 1800 2000 people in the chat by the time the by the time the show's over, that's pretty good. I was really looking forward to using that new studio, but hey, it's good to have more than one studio, isn't it, guys? Awesome. Yeah, I was really, I, the, we started at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock this morning, while you guys were watching, many of you were watching the Inspired presentation. We were already in the studio putting the, putting all this together, getting all the sound checks, and we had it so perfect. I can whisper leaning back in my chair, and the audio picks up so beautifully. We were using those mics wrong. We had the wrong cables, wrong HDMIs. We had the wrong stands, everything. We, we corrected all that. And then downloaded that OBS software, and we just didn't understand it. It's just, it's not something that you can readily understand instantly, and nor can you get a feel for how you how, how to how to do it unless you actually use it so it's going to have to come with somebody who knows what they're talking about because i can't use the obs and go live unless i'm going live using the obs so it's like a catch-22 i'd have to i'd have to start a bunch of live videos trying to figure out how to use it and then and then delete them all instantly that's yeah, crazy Thank you, Shiva. Maybe you can educate us on that because we were both lost. Matt's over there in the other studio right now trying to figure out what went wrong. Because everything, all the tests went right until we actually tried to go live on YouTube and then nothing made sense. I saw somebody mention that uh, earlier in the year I was at 17,000 subs and I'm almost at 70,000. I, I have to correct you on that. In January, there are videos that I released in January where people were congratulating me in the comments section for reaching uh, 4,000 subs. And, uh, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 3,000 subs. That's January of 2022. I had like 3,100 subs. 
So it wasn't until March 19th when I had 4,200 subscribers to the Archaics channel. March 19th was when I did the podcast with Santos Bonacci, but it was mainly Logan of Decode Your Reality who was interviewing me. That is when I started increasing. And uh, even Santos in that video mentioned on March 19th that I had around 5,000 subs, but he was incorrect because when that video was being recorded, I had 4,200 subs. So by that, by the end of that evening, I was like it at all, almost 5,000. But yeah, that's a, it's a, it's, it's an awesome increase. It is. It's an, it's an awesome increase. Now, as you can see, like the channel inspired, they got half a million subs. So I don't know. And if you look at his content, go back and look at all the people that Gene has talked to and especially the subject matter. They're talking about some deep stuff, naming names, going into all kinds of, I don't really go into the particulars in archaics. I don't go out there uh, demon chasing as far as naming people in, in the political world and exposing them for their conspiracies and all that. No, I, my, my material is very general. So I'm, very, I'm often surprised when I see in the comments section that people are that people get triggered, like, how the hell can you even be on YouTube? You must be, you must be controlled opposition. Why haven't they deleted your channel yet? Deleted it for what? Have you seen all these other channels with half a million to a million subs and what they're talking about? Yeah. Dr. Steve Turley just got 1 million subs and he's exposing the deep state socialist Democrats for almost every single thing they do. And he reports that stuff in real time. He puts out multiple videos or shorts a day. Dr. Steve Turley exposed everything that would just happen with the elections. He made, the man goes deep exposing these narratives that are false while the mainstream media is packaging these things so you'll lower your vibration and giving you all this information. There are people like Dr. Steve Turley that are putting out the truth and showing you where that information can be found. Yeah, especially this election where it was just a massive wins in the Republican side, but none of it's reported by the media. Man, go to the congressional websites. Go, you need to follow Dr. Steve Turley, and he'll show you exactly what was on. All the legislative battles that were just won. It's amazing. That's where the wars being fought. It's a Tenth Amendment war. I kind of mentioned it in passing in the uh, uh, in my other video. But yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I told you guys 18, 19 months ago when my predictions videos were out, when the socialists were at the height of their power, when. This uh, fake media was at the height of their power. When, when the controllers of social media were at the height of their power, I told you guys that there's going to be a huge shift. Conservatives will, will take over. I said there's going to be a huge shift in the media. The media is going to lose their su subscribers. They're going to lose their followers. They're going to lose their funding. I'm talking about mainstream media. Look at all the pundits. Look at all the the talk show hosts. Look at all the news anchors who have lost their jobs in the last 90 days. Oh, my God. And there's more to come. All the cuts in Facebook and CNN. All, I'm talking about massive layoffs coming in all these departments across. That, I mean, they're not, they're not on top anymore. Yeah, their narratives are all falling apart. The, the, we are in the pendulum swing right now. Yeah, there was never going to be a time when there was going to be a complete takeover and switch. It's gradual, but with these midterm elections, it was more than gradual. There's been it's it's amazing. Even even a lot I know a lot of people dislike Trump, and yes, he's a deep stater, just like all the elite are. But I'm going to tell you now, the man the man backed and endorsed 237 candidates. 219 of those candidates won. That tells you something. Yeah, the media, the mainstream media is not reporting that. It's crazy. Things are going, things are going on. You're going to see a lot of revelations about, about this. That was all predicted 18 months ago that that narrative was going to fall apart and be exposed. I said, you're going to see a matter a lot. Before the end of the year, we got a lot of events that will unfold more and more. The problem is, is these things happen gradually. So you are desensitized from the reveals as they go on days, they stretch just like, just like the Arizona election stretched out for five or six days. 
Yeah, they stretch that all the way out. It's going to lower your vibration. You get fed up. You get tired. By the time somebody wins, you don't even care anymore. So, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. It's crazy how they do all that. But this is a Q&A. This is not me. This is not me ranting. This is not, not any of that. This is straight q and I, I wish it, it was supposed to be with Matt sitting next to me reading the questions. And uh, But, you know, I can see that's, that just didn't happen. And that's okay. Cool beans. Mini Roddy, that's cool beans. Let's see. Yeah, T. Harmon, you're going to be surprised. Dr. Steve Harley, yeah, you can tell him Archaic sent you. I've been listening to him for a while. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be the first one to admit I didn't like him. I didn't like his personality. I don't like I don't like what I perceived about him when I was listening to his voice. I'm judgmental just like other people. I'm human. And when you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna sense something about the man too when you listen to his voice and the way and his enunciation and how he carries himself. But that's okay. It's his information that is that is it's genuine. It's awesome. It's not. I can I can divorce I can divorce a person from their platform from what the information that they're conveying. I can do that. I mean that's just maturity, and I have to do that with Dr. Steve Turley. I'm not sure that in the person in the personal that I, he and I would really get along or, but I I'm impressed with his information. So Dr. Steve Tardy, that's where it's at. Tell him archaic sent you. All right. Hey, Matt Kubis, Pamela Swan, Phoenix protocol, Mish Gil Gleason. I appreciate you moderator. Hey, Michael, I'm a Shiva shampoo, the cleanest, the cleanest of the Vedic of the Vedic genre. Shiva shampoo, Wendy Flores, Thank you guys for being here. I don't know how many of you saw the video with Inspired. I wanted to do a question and answer based off that video for people uh, that, that was wanting to, um, you know, we're curious about any of the things that we discussed. Uh, Atlantis Rising Podcast, man. That's okay. He said, my bad. That's okay. It's just, well, I just wanted, when you said that earlier about the 17,000, I saw the comments. I read the comments daily. I'm in the comment sections all the time. But uh, when I saw that comment, kind of made me wonder because I remember differently. And I went back and looked. I pulled up those videos from January and I looked in the comment section. I remember, okay, here it is. So, yeah. I think I hit 17,000 somewhere around, see, March, April, May, sometime around May. All right. Fifth element, typing 10,000 day words a day. Yeah, I have a team, guys, that are working on Chronicon. It's a very extensive project. What took me like 20 years of collating data, putting it together, doing the mathematical calculations for each individual section, aligning all these different calendars, uh, showing these constructs throughout our history, what took me a lifetime almost or a significant portion of my lifetime, this team is doing in just months. Uh, they're all, they're, yeah, they're, it's, it's, we have a, we have a discord where we all talk together and they ask me questions and things we can rectify, correct things we can, we can accentuate. It's uh they're, they're doing a very good job. It's very interesting. So the, the project is getting finished way faster than I thought. I'll be adding a lot of, of new data to it which they have access to it, but I just, I, I have to be the one that puts it where it goes, where it's relevant. So yeah, this studio here, I'm sorry about the, the poor quality of the audio. It's the other studio where it really matters, where we're having these problems with that OBS. Gerald Livingston, do, do your thing, man. If you want to narrate the dark scriptures, go ahead. It's easy to do. If you look in the links, you will find that we have a we have a transcripts website where the transcripts for individual videos have already been published. You can find the dark scriptures transcripts there and make it much easier for you to narrate. And do your thing. A lot of channels have a lot of channels have picked up picked up on different aspects of the archaics material and run with it. And I encourage that. Nick T is reading Chronicon. He's like on he, he, he's I don't know where he's at. He's I, last I saw was 77, 78, or 79, the 79th episode of Chronicon. Each one six, seven, eight minutes long. 
but he's reading Chronicon and, and he's doing a fantastic job. A lot of people like to listen to it. Nick T is doing that. As a matter of fact, it's the only channel featured in my, uh, in the, uh, on my homepage feature, which I need to feature some others. I, I know, uh, there's some other channels that are using my material too. I need to feature them too. It's just Nick T was, was in my face that day. And that's the day I was, I was upgrading my, my, uh, my YouTube page. Oh, spe concerning that I have two more YouTube channels. Two more YouTube channels have been have been designed now. One of them is called uh, uh, Archaics Reserved. I haven't put anything on that channel. The other one I've already started uploading, but you can't see it because I haven't made them public yet. But it is my Phalorn Saga. I told you guys when I was in prison, I also wrote an epic fantasy series, about a, about 800 pages of book, but it's seven books long. And it's an epic fantasy. It's a fairy apocalypse and how the fairies are dealing with an end of the world scenario that was prophesied in a world that is now being taken over by humans and it's different races of fairies. And, uh, it's, it's the world is called Dagathar. And I, and I wrote this toward the end of all my research before I was released from prison. And uh, I, I, I essentially take up my worldview and my beliefs and I wrap it all into a fantasy, epic fantasy narrative. It's deep, it's adult, uh, but I'm reading, I'm reading the individual chapters as episodes and I'm numbering them. And instead of splitting them up into books and all that, I'm just going one through 500, however many chapters there are. I've already started and uh, I'm going to wait till I get about 12, about a dozen chapters in and then I'll activate each individual one. It's just me giving back to you guys for your support. I'm not going to charge anything. It's absolutely free, but you will be able to listen to me narrate my epic fantasy book uh, about the, called the Phalorn Saga. The Phalorn are, are a lost, they're a lost race of fairy kind. They're, they're, they're ostracized and they're very different than the Fae and the normal fairies and all that's described in the story. But it's the Phalorn Saga and uh, you'll be able to, uh, matter of fact, the Phalorn Saga is the name of that, uh, is the name of my new YouTube channel. So it's Archaics Reserved, which I haven't put any videos on yet, and the Phalorn Saga. Just two announcements. As a matter of fact, I have some announcement announcement card here. Also, the book Ancient Healing. I have it in here. I'm gonna stick to my word. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that book to the person who has the most likes uh, on that post. That's done. That person's already it's already written who's who's getting that book. However, so many people are interested in the content of that book, and a lot of people are are asking me to break the law and many, and I got too many haters that, that would hurry up and report me if I did anything like that. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to photocopy the book and, and render it into PDF and distribute it. It'd be a violation of copyright. I could get sued for that. I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do or what Matt's going to do is he's going to video the book as a book report and we're, he's going to give his opinion page for page on this book. And that video will be posted on YouTube for you to do whatever you want. Screenshot each individual page so you can learn what, what the book's about. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to I'm going to keep my word. The person with the most likes on, on that on that post is the one that will I, will I will ask for their address and and I will mail them the book. That's the best way I can do that. Yeah, I actually have like three videos with Santos Bonacci. Two of them were very rapidly, and then one was much later. I need to do another one. I, I need to. I need to catch up with him. I mean, he and I are very are different in our worldviews. We're different in in the presentation of our information. But I consider consider him a friend. Uh, he's got his haters too, but but I'm not one of them. I will be doing another show with Autodidactic. I was thinking about wearing my autodidactic shirt today. I have one. Oh, I'm wearing I'm wearing my Rise Above shirt today. Got Rise Above, guys. Y'all don't know about Rise Above? I like their setup. I like their energy. I like uh the uh, you know the main guy. Uh, he's he's uh. 
they enter they, they they really entertain a lot of stuff just basically who they who they talk to and all that a lot of modern stuff but but i see great potential in that first of all rise above is a great is a great name their studio setup is a little unique. I liked that too. I liked the aerial view all, all the way down and different guys were doing different functions while uh, also um, he breaks off into his own personal music and he's got a pretty good thing going. So uh, Rise Above, I was on their website. I bought me a t-shirt. I've seen him in my chat every once in a while. So let's go in here and Let's go in here and do exactly what I said I was going to do, which was Q&A. And it looks like from the beginning, from the beginning, the, uh, probably lost a lot of, a lot of viewers from that switch over. I don't know. I really don't know. By this time we should have had over a thousand, but that's okay. Might be a bad time of day. This is very early. I, I normally don't do my, my podcast this early. I just don't. Cindy Langston. Okay. Jason, what are your thoughts on the souls of animals? This is a question that I have entertained before, but not very much. Probably only only gave an answer one time, but I do remember giving the answer in one of my prior, prior Q&As. Now, we have to quantify what, what you mean by animal. Because to me, amphibians, fish, reptiles, marine creatures, not marine mammals, but marine creatures are soulless. They are they are programmed 100% visceral. They are in a pr predator versus prey mentality uh, because it's pure programming. I don't see any evidence of reptiles and, and amphibians and fish having souls. I see them as the re pure result of coding everything that they do. Everything is instinctual. Instincts are, are coding. Everything is visceral. So I do not feel the same way about mammals. Mammals display many of the traits that humans display, but to a lesser degree. The difference seems to be in magnitude, not in uh, anything fundamental. There, mammals can be sad, bored, depressed, happy, elated, full of joy. They are, uh, uh, and the same things bring them these same emotions, such as uh, eating a really eating really good food will make a make a dog's tail wag faster. All right, the physical clues. I mean, the dogs are programmed to give you visual. Uh, evidence of their emotions and feelings. This is why the dogs, while the dog's face doesn't change much, the ears express everything. How the ears move, how the ears uh, lay down flat, how, man, they, dogs can express so many different thoughts and emotions and react to you in so many different ways by the positioning of their ears and the movement of their tail. So, now, dogs are, you know, dogs are completely domesticated. They are not natural. Uh, the dogs did not nat were not naturally produced. Uh, if you were to hold to a uniformitarian natural selection, all it, it, just, it doesn't. Dogs are not descended from dingoes. They are genetically different. Dogs and all their different breeds are not, well, we are told they are descended from wolves, but that's not what we find. There has been some very good research out that dogs were specifically bred from wolf genes, but there was manipulation involved. And uh, like Otto Van, Otto Van Bender, Binder, and some other some other researchers in the fifties and sixties, they had come, they had, they had cited some really profound material showing that there was a. a the canine is unique and different breeds are ancient. They go back, but the evidence is, is genetic. They were genetic modifications of something not natural, not produced by the environment. Now this goes in tandem with the archaics research and many other researchers like, like uh, Jonathan Gray, who show evidence that we were technologically advanced in the ancient past. And it wasn't the other way around. We did not start primitive. We were introduced into the simulacrum with all the technologies and all the bells and whistles and all, and all the advantages that we enjoyed on the outside of the construct. 
we had it all in here. Awesome civilization, fantastic infrastructure, and then it all ended. And, and history is the story of how we have survived until the present. So I hope that answers your questions. I, I believe that they possess a soul. I'm not, I do not know as to what kind of soul or if a animal soul can be, ever become human. I don't know. I don't know. So I know that the oversoul has never stopped creating and the creation continues even as we speak. And because of that, because of that, there is every, every chance that initiates into the similicum programs must first enter in as, as like, uh, hom hominuk, I can't even pronounce it, like familiars, like animals. They're not allowed. You have to graduate uh, before you can actually be introduced as a human avatar. So there's all kinds of scenarios that could be unfolding. And, and, and maybe on the outside of the construct, it would be so simple. Because there's many, many, many personalities on the outside of the construct who have never volunteered for a simulacrum experience. But, or, but volunteers are not allowed to come in as a mature human avatar. They must start at a certain degree, and they get to choose what those degrees are. Or maybe they've got to earn them. Maybe, maybe they have to be both predator and prey in the, in the mammalian kingdoms before they're ever allowed to upgrade when they come back in as a human avatar. What I'm, what I'm describing to you is only a logical presentation of, of, of material that I have theorized about, but that's what it is. It's entirely theoretical. I have no proof for this. None. It just makes sense to me. I agree. Animals are very special and endeared to us. There is a connection. There's a soul connection with, with animals, but not with reptiles and not with amphibians and not with fish and, and, and insects. They, those are pure programming. Mm. All right. Q&A. I promise to answer questions. So I'm looking. Remember, all caps. If you want me to see it and distinguish your question from all the all the comments that you have with each other, make sure it's in all caps. Because if it's in all caps, my eyes will hit it fast. I, I tend to ignore when you guys are just talking to each other. Should I invest in a big boat in California? I'm a... Uh, I think a better advice was whatever money you intended to invest on a very expensive boat, you should just move. That's what I think. California's fine right now, but it's, I mean, it all depends on what you're talking about, what time frame you're talking about. I don't see anything really bad happening to California until 2038, 2039, 2040. Till then, I think you're fine in California. But you're not going to be fine any, any almost anywhere west of the Rockies come 2040. East of the Appalachian Mountains. I don't think you're going to be fine there at all either. Yeah. And basically where I'm at right now, 30 degrees north latitude. 30, I'm at 31 degrees north latitude right now. I'm in trouble if I was to stay right here at this geographical location. But then again, I might not be in trouble because there could be there's all kinds of things that could happen. But it's a... Uh, from the way from the way the world is going to move this time, it's going to go south in my area of the world. And that's straight into the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you, Shelly S. I seen Jahara's name somewhere. Tori Victoria, how you doing? A lot of these names are very familiar to me. Looking for another question. I can predict Jason has 70,000 subs by the end of the day. Well, that's a good prediction. I like you already. Who is it? Soul Inspire. You know what? It's not even a mount. I said this in a podcast about a couple months ago. It is not, um, it's not the amount of subs that you have on a channel. It's the quality of the subs. There are some channels that have 3.5 3 million subs. And then when they release a video... They got 9,000 views. There's something wrong with that. 
you can tell you can tell when people have lost interest people will always abandon those who bore them they will always do that you know you can you can tell you can tell the channels that 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 didn't grow organically Remember, guys, I spent two and a half years uploading videos, man. I, I couldn't even break a thousand subs. But then again, I wasn't really trying because I never marketed myself outside of the Archaics Facebook group. And the, in the Archaics Facebook group, everything was contained because I have a personal philosophy. I don't take the Archaics material to other groups because people would get triggered and offended all the time uh, about three and a half years ago. So I just quit. I, I had Matthews just stop, man. You know what? Just quit posting in other groups, the arcades, because these other guys, man, they get they get triggered and all that. So we quit. So for about two years, nothing was posted about arcades anywhere on Facebook, but in the arcades group. And then the arcades group started growing. I noticed that instantly. It started growing. There's 16,000 people in the group now. And that's another announcement I have. Oh, uh, 250 something posts were removed from the arcades Facebook group. A lot of trolls were were blocked. From the Facebook group, uh, now has sixteen thousand members. It has been cleaned up. Now you can go into the Archaics Facebook group and see all the original posts, the newer posts, a lot of the things that I, almost all the things that I wrote, graphics that you probably haven't seen before. A lot of data was put into the Archaics group, but it was lost in the threads because I had made a promise to the Archaics, Archaics members of the Archaics Facebook group that I'm never going to allow this group to become like the other Facebook groups, which, which people were posting all kinds of stuff. And if you find that, if you find a post that's been on multiple Facebook groups, you're not going to find it in archaics. I wasn't going to allow it, but I have been too preoccupied. I have been so busy doing other things. I'm still running a comp company, Paradise Rock Gardens, still managing a crew, making sure they are there. They get where they're supposed to go and, and they have everything that they need. This YouTube is not my only income. I'm still in command, basically, of, of a crew that is going around doing different jobs. Right now, they're doing Christmas lights. And I and for a couple of days, that's why I've been silent. For a couple of days, I had to get out there on roofs and, and, and help them keep up and maintain while they were a man short. I'm going to do that because I invested a significant amount of energy in my life to building that company and getting a reputation in, the, in this environment. And I'm not going to, I'm not willingly, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that go. That will always be an income I can rely on in case something else happens or if I need to purchase something extremely large or uh, or very expensive. So right now I'm letting those guys pay, basically make all the money because they're doing all the work. But if I need to, I can get back, right back into the work field and, uh, and I can get my cut too. I just don't need to right now. Arch Archaics, YouTube. Uh, pretty much pays all the bills, and so does my Gumroad sales and Podia sales. I get Amazon royalties and Booktree royalties, so I have multiple income streams. I'm not rich, but I'm taken care of so I can do the things that I want to do, which is produce data for archaics. So uh, having said all that, I'm, uh, I'm not boasting at all. I'm just, I keep I'm not going to close doors that I've opened and, and, and maintained. I'm just not going to close doors. So Sometimes I need to get out there and I need to go help those boys when they're, when they're shorthanded. I'm going to continue to do that. Looking for a question. My son liked your lights video. Ah, he's doing it in hometown Vegas. I've been to Vegas twice in both times. I was too young to really do anything. Let's see. I was a teenager. Looking for a question. Thank you for that prediction on the 70,000, though. You're probably right. I'll probably have it before midnight tonight. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Looking for a question. Oh, it would have been easy having Matt here. What's your thoughts on the, on the Euphrates River drying up? Really don't have many thoughts. With how the Euphrates and the Tigris have changed because of earthquakes, because of subsidence, because of, of older irrigation and canal works collapsing and then filling up, backfilling with mud and sand, the Euphrates and the Tigris have changed courses many times. So every time that they dry up and go into another direction and change course, 
archaeologists are going to find older ruins. There's there's older substrate from prior civilizations. They're going to be there. Now, do I believe a lot of the things I'm seeing on YouTube and the thumbnails about demons being found under the Euphrates and ancient crypts and all that? No. When I when I when I see it in trusted sources, I will. I don't believe I I'm I'm real hesitant about anything I see in a YouTube thumbnail because most of them are most of them you, you guys already know, but they're they're just sensationalist BS. I want you to come over watch the video, and by the time you're done watching the video, you realize every single thing you just heard was entirely theoretical. It was all conjectural, and it was just designed to to ignite your curiosity, but it but it was filled with absolutely no substance. So yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm gonna have to look into the Euphrates deal more. But even if it does dry up, so what? What what's that? What does that mean to us? Way over here, like, like I'm in America. If the Mississippi dried up, it would mean a lot because there is a lot of cargo barges that go up and down the Mississippi delivering all kinds of things. But uh, I don't know. Oh, rise above, rise and shine. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's if that's connected to a prophecy. Is there a prophecy that says the Euphrates will dry up? I don't know. I believe there's a prophecy that says that a vast army is going to cross the Euphrates. Which the past being a predicate for the future, that's already happened because we know we know Alexander of Macedon did it, and I believe Julian did it too. So uh in his wars against Persia. Julian might have been one. I think he did the same thing Alexander did. Julian, I believe he burned his ships too. 10,000 words a day. Fifth element, you're a beast. Looking for a question. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, smash that like button. Let that algorithm know you're here. Okay, I already saw you, Gerald Livingston. Yeah, go ahead. You're free. You're free to narrate the dark scriptures, man. Create you a whole YouTube channel and do it if you want. Send me the link so I can send people there. Let's see. Uh, where are some questions? I am Kairos. You asked this question at 1221. It's now 1253. That's how far behind I am. Are any of the historical photos AIX generated to support false narratives? Listen, I believe a lot of the photos you see about all kinds of different things on YouTube and Facebook are false indeed. There's one that I fell for for a couple of hours. Um, I, I wrote, I sent, like, I sent messages to several people saying I need so I need to understand the provenance of this image before I, I use it. And one of them, uh, I use it for Archaic's logo now, now that I know it's fake, but it shows almost a black and white old picture of the side of a cliff. And yet etched into the cliff is a square high rise build looking, looking building. And I, it's always fascinated me looking at that. But I checked into the provenance. I run it through a Google image search. It all comes back as BS. This is an absolutely Photoshopped image, and there's a bunch of them. A lot of images on Tartaria, a lot of images across, across YouTube are bogus. They, they're complete BS. Now, you can pretty much separate fact from fiction by, by who is presenting them. There are people who are very careful about what they show, as opposed to some, some of those that... They're not trying to hear. They're showing everything, and they're not separating fact and fiction. So I'm going to tell you now, John Levy's pretty careful about that. Autodidactic's careful about that. The obvious fakes are filtered out. So they're not the only ones. There's, there's others that, that, that do it. I don't want to exclude anybody. I'm just saying you got to be careful with what you accept. This is why I many, many, many times I've told you guys in my own presentations, I will never take a photograph as evidence of anything. And I stick by that. Even today, photo, that's why people send me pictures of UFOs. Pe people send me all, all kinds of photographic evidence. That I don't know what filters that image is passed through for it to be in your possession. Then to get to my possession, an image, can, an image can show anything. I will never accept an image as proof of anything. I will accept boots on the ground research when authors are publishing books about phenomena and they and they've been on the ground and they're researching it and they write about it and they cite their sources and they do scientific analysis of it. That's when I can accept an image. 
such as some of the agroglyphs, not all of the agroglyphs, but some of those crop circles, we have, we've got books published about them, especially the Julia set. The Julia set is a mathematical geometrical marvel. And unless you have a computer, you can't even replicate it. The angles, you can't get a stick and a rope and, and do a Julia set. There's no way. It's almost like a, a, a fractal of a Mandelbrot set. It is that complex. The Julia set and the triple Julia set crop circles were never made by men. And there are men who have published books that show this. They have boots on the ground. They have gone out there with their devices. They have they have done chemical analysis on the stocks and they show there's no no stocks are snapped. And, the, and they're not even laid over like the theory of boards going to make a circle. They're not. They are woven together and then laid down without snapping these brisk stocks have not splintered like they normally would. They laid down. So these, these people have done research and they, and, they, and they study the bins and the stocks and they see that they've been chemically altered by something to allow them to soften and then lay down and weave. So then there's, there's locals who say that these orbs, these yellow orbs of light have been seen blinking and pulsating in fields at night. And in the morning, in the morning, the crop circles were there. These are things I can accept because they come with so much ancillary data. When, when an image comes with that much ancillary data, I can accept it. Okay, well, that's pretty interesting because so far, no humans have ever come forth and demonstrated how they can use boards and ropes or even scientific equipment and replicate a Julius set. I don't care about those other crop circles. If there are no humans today that with all the funding in the world and all the equipment in the world can't go into a, a wheat field right now and on film show the rest of us how you do a Julia set or a triple Julia set in a, in a field, then they are mysterious. I don't care about all the people coming forth talking about they've been uh, the crop circles are faked and all that stuff. Of course, a bunch of them are faked, but not the good ones, not the ones I showed in that video last week. Those are an anomaly, and they're attached to books that have been published by people with boots on the ground who, who show <coughs> who show exactly why they are an anomaly. So, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, maybe I'm drinking out the wrong side of this cup. That was the chew them up and spit out the bone side. All right. Anyway, you guys know I love my coffee. And I'll, I am eternally grateful to you guys that have sent me boxes of, of coffee beans. Ever since Lord Matthew, prerogative tax assessor, sent me my coffee grinder, I have used it every single day. He's the one also that sent me my Archaics stamp of approval. Yes, he did. So anyway... Let me find some more. Yeah, I can't take an image as evidence of anything unless it comes with a lot, a lot of backing. Okay, there's a book from 1877. My buddy Barry was going to give me a Christmas present. And uh, he was so excited to tell me when I visited him the other day and I did my van vlog. Then he went ahead and showed it to me. He said, man, I got you a gift coming, man. I just, here, I'm going to show it to you. So Barry lives so far out in the sticks. It takes me an hour and 10 minutes to get there. And I live in the sticks. I live in Willis, Texas. I'm way out there. The closest thing to me is, gas, is a truck stop way, way over by the interstate. Listen, he showed it to me. My jaw dropped. I said, I said, somebody's selling that book. He said, yeah, it's on eBay. Book's on eBay right here, man. I could not believe it. It, is a, it is a book that is cited by all these people in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Emmanuel Velikovsky. This book is, is like, it's the masterpiece of the 1800s. It is the secret of lost races, published in 1877. I could not believe I saw this book, and it was in excellent condition. And somebody had put it on YouTube. I mean, on, on eBay for almost nothing. And Barry was going to wait because he had bid on the book. And his his bid was the, was the winning bid thus far. I panicked. 
As soon as he showed it to me, I said, I said, listen, man, I, I really appreciate the sentiment. I really do. But as soon as the right person sees that book, it's going to be lost to us. I am willing. I am willing to throw money at it right now just to secure that. He said, is that important to you? I says, dude, you have no idea the history of this book. I cannot believe one's been found. Dude, this is amazing. He says, well, if it's that important, let me contact the guy, man. So I said, listen, up your bid and tell him to lock it in. Tell him it's a 24. I just tell him he's got 24 hours to respond. Just up the bid. And if he responds, we'll pay him this much money. So the man responded, locked it in. It's already in the mail. It's going to Barry. When Barry tells me he's got it, I'm doing a van vlog all the way there. I'm driving all the way there, doing a van vlog. And on video at the end that van vlog, I'm going to show you this book. We're going to flip through it. And I promise you, several videos will come out of this book. So I'm sorry. I'm really excited. You guys can tell I'm really excited about this book. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm beside myself. I'm like a kid in a candy store. Okay, I'm going to catch up with some, some questions since I'm done running my mouth about it. 1,200 1,257 people in the chat. I thank you guys. 640 likes. Hey, you know what? That's a pretty good ratio, two to one. But yes, I do believe, I am Kairos, that Artificial Intelligence X has generated many, many images and photographs to, to justify false, or to support false narratives. Yes, I believe that. Yep. Well, you're welcome, Karen Shorky. Our world is not what you think. Absolutely. Looking for a question. Well, we got Logan in here. I seen somebody said Logan of Decode Your Reality. Logan's buddy. We just did a video like last week, I think. Looking for, thank you, Big Rocks. Looking for a question. Jeff Six, I've been watching Turley for two years now. Yeah, I like Turley. I like his information. Looking for, wow, okay, here's, some, here's something. Oh, that's Benny Riley using all caps. There's no question in it, though. Sherlock Holmes. Looking for a question. <clears throat> Jason, what do you know about the Fabian Society? I don't. I don't. I'm, I just pulled up an absolute loss for Fabian. I, I am familiar with the word Fabians. I mean, the term Fabian Society, but I can't remember anything that they're about or what time period it was. Something I, might, I may need to look into. Or you can send me an, an email and educate me. All right, looking for a question. I'm Kairos. I already answered that one. So it tells me I'm way behind in the chat. Go back up here and look at it again. Okay, I've seen a bunch of questions now. I was just behind. Dynamost Anastasis. Have you had any ideas on the purpose of the mechanism inside the inside the pyramid? Well, <clears throat> it's still a difficult one. We know that there was um, uh, an immense explosion inside the king's chamber. We know this. It seems like something that would control magnitude or pressure was in a locking system in the antechamber. The antechamber is fed into by a small square you got to crawl through from this immense, gigantic grand gallery that goes down at 26 degrees 153 feet so we're looking at 
we're looking at a mechanism that used those tracks. Now, if you look at modern day photographs, you're going to see that the, the Egyptian government has covered a lot of those tracks up. But those tracks are in all the original photographs and all the original diagrams put together by Sir Flinders Petrie and David Davidson in the 1920s. Uh, he was an engineer. He did fantastic illustrations of the precision of the interior arrangements of the Great Pyramid, and you can see those on many of my videos. Shows those black and white holographic illustrations. It shows the tracks. Something went up and down that. Now, I don't know if it was something large and heavy and needed those tracks to adjust pressure or to adjust the, the space that something else moved in. I don't know. I don't know. I have never been to the Great Pyramid to actually get a feel and understand what it is that we're dealing with, because I, I do know that it was technolithic, meaning not only did machines build the Great Pyramid, but the Great Pyramid's internal arrangements are a vast, they have an engineering purpose. So I don't know. It's I would really like to go, but me going on a trip internationally like that would require some other variables to be right in my life. I've already been offered full paid trips. Two different individuals have offered to pay full, full trip to Egypt back to just to go pyramid back. I have to, had to decline both of them. I'm not comfortable with that right now. Have you heard the Earth is a ship theory and we're attached to a screen operating avatar? Well, my own theory is that, and I know this sounds really ridiculous to a lot of people. I get that. But I'm not afraid to say it. Based off all my historical analysis, the only thing that makes sense to me is that the simulacrum is a contained field inside something else. I believe that because of the nature of the data that we find in the backfield of information that we call history, it all focuses on a cataclysm of a double star system and one star dying. And then what happens to a multiplicity of worlds when that explosion occurs and the trajectories of those worlds when exactly they appear in the soul system? Because it was a nearby, I mean, it was a, it was a binary, meaning these two stars were the same system and each one had, had their own worlds. And then when one of them blew up, certain of those worlds were known to go in this direction. No one knows what happens to the other ones. Although we do have legends of like Electra, how it was destroyed, but it's never entered our system. So I don't know. We could be on a capital ship right now running Sims, trying to figure out the best way to survive when the nemesis cataclysm occurs. Because it's my position that all the histories that we have in the backfield of our experience, they haven't happened yet. They're actually the future. Meaning, meaning these were simulations trying to get ready for an event that is on the horizon that we're in the middle of traveling. Now, remember, it is a fundamental tenet of many ancient belief systems that we are pilgrims, sojourners. We are travelers between worlds. We, we have left one and we are on the way to another. And these ideas have filtered into our faiths. Yeah, different religions believe the exact same thing, but they lost the original idea's meaning. Yeah, I believe, I, I believe that it's exactly the scenario we're in. I have to believe that nothing else makes sense about the origin of all these timekeeping systems and calendars because they're all focused on when different er, different worlds appeared in our system. <coughs> and this Moody system is when Earth started right here in the solar system. Phoenix, 4309 BC, Phoenix appears here first. And then every 138 years, it's perfectly situated to be right there between the sun and earth in the month of May, mid-May every time. Now, remember, this is a computer simulation. It's not a real solar system. That's why we have this mathematical perfection that would otherwise never exist. It can, couldn't exist in a real, in a real natural like Newtonian universe, but it can. The historical record is mathematically precise only because it's coding. 
because if it was real, it wouldn't have been able to do, do this. So there are many, many reasons why I have developed the theory that I have. Even the idea that the Phoenix is keeper of the calendar, which is actually called an old text. But we understand this concept because all the calendars of the ancient world change. We know they change in the 8th century BC. We have the records. We have the historical citations from all over the world where calendars were modified and everybody had to add five days. It was always unlucky days, dark days, evil days, the five unwanted days. And they added them to the end of their calendars. This was done because the, the year was 360 days. And we have an entirely different series of data sets from all over the world that show all the ancient calendar systems were all divisible by 360. 365.25 is not divisible in any ancient calendrical system. None. So we have a we have this new calendar imposed on our world, which is now 365.25 days. Something happened. But whatever happened, it didn't affect the 138-year perfect periodicity of the Phoenix phenomenon. Phoenix is keeper of the calendar. Everything is simulated because outside the context of a simulated holography, what I'm telling you now cannot be true. It just couldn't. It's impossible for the year to change from 360 days, which we can verify, to 365.25, which, which is what we have now, and is easily verifiable. There's no way that could have happened, and yet one of the major phenomena from the ancient world all the way up till 1902 is a 138-year periodicity of a phenomenon that is very well documented. It can't happen. Because after a thousand years, it wouldn't have been every 138 years. It would have been off. The addition of five days to every year would have totally changed the math. But it didn't. Phoenix still keeps the calendar. Only as coding protocols could two completely separate mathematical constructs be aligned perfectly. It's the only way it could happen. So uh, these are these are just things. These are, I mean... It all sounds very Star Wars. It all sounds very Star trek -y. But it's not. It's just logical. It's just taking each cognitive leap to the next logical uh, uh, conclusion based off all the data sets that we have put together. Because history was falsified. But we didn't falsify it. Something else did. But in that falsity are gems and kernels of evidences and truth that we can put together. And one of them is the Phoenix phenomenon. You never heard about the Phoenix phenomenon until I brought it to your attention. That means it was hidden, but every bit of it was there to be discovered. It's not the only one. Nemesis X, the 792-year periodicity of the Nemesis X, X, Nemesis X object. Uh, the Mayan Long Count's original Bactons of 144,000 days on the 360-day count system that was uh, uh, available at the time was 400 years. 400 years was a great epic called a Bacton in the Mayan long count. 144,000 days di uh, divided by 360. It's 400 years. But after the year changed to 365.25, it knocked it down to 395.4 years. Now a Bacton, to get 144,000 days, which is a, the Bacton. Remember, the Bacton wasn't 400 years. It was 144,000 days. It's a day count system. Therefore, how many years was irrelevant? This is why the Mayan, the Mayan calendar totally changed in 713 BC. It was no longer 400 year, years, which was the old uh, 1,444,000 days. It's now 395.4 years because the years changed to 365.25 days. So to make that 144,000 days of a Bacton, there's no way 2012 could have been the end of the Mayan long count. And the scholars in the 1950s that reconstructed the Mayan mathematics should have taken this into consideration, but they didn't. I published a book called Anunnaki Homeworld in 2011 based off research done in 2006 and in 2007. My publisher released that book in the nick of time. Hundreds of books were talking about 2012 being the end of the world. My book, which was largely ignored at the time, but my sales are really good now. But my book was telling everybody it's bullshit. All these authors are wrong. They haven't done their homework. All they had to do was pull out a calculator and do the math themselves. But instead, just like modern authors today, like Graham Hancock, he's, he's one of the worst. 
But just like modern authors today, they automatically assume is true what they find in older books, especially authoritarian books. So as soon as somebody is considered an authority like John Anthony Hopkins, as soon as somebody says, oh, okay, with well, everything this guy says about the Mesoamericans, man, must be true. He's, he's an authority. Academia pushes him. Mainstream media loves him. So here we have John Anthony West. Excuse me. I said Hop, Hop, Hopkins. My, my apologies. John Anthony West. So we have John Anthony West. He has now been put on a pedestal as an authority. So other authors don't come behind John Anthony West and look at his arithmetic or look at his findings. Instead, they write their books like the Earth Chronicles or, or Graham Hancock series of books or Andy Collins. They look at they look at what John Anthony West put out and then they build from that. And then 10 years later, a new author comes comes forward. And he sees what Andrew Collins put together, so he builds from that, knowing he can rely on Andrew Collins said it, so it must be true, because Andrew Collins is citing John Anthony West. You see, do you see what I'm what I'm inferring here? Almost almost a hundred percent of everything published in the pseudoscientific uh a literature that is so popular on history right now. The the Anthony the, the what is it the uh, the uh, John Bobble or what his name is I don't remember right? Graham Hancock and all his clique all those same type of authors. This is what they've done. Yes, there's value in some of their writings. Yes, they've gotten really close to the truth in some areas, but you can go chapter by chapter by chapter and just pull that shit apart. And I might do it. I might get. I might get. I might just get fed up one day with everybody mentioning uh, 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 Graham Hancock and his new little Netflix series. I might just go through each episode, man, and just show you guys the truth because it's available. We have access to it. I'm not picking on the guy. I don't really. I don't know him personally, but it, it comes to the point where if I believe you've read the same text I am, but you're coming up with totally different scenarios and publishing those, publicizing those scenarios, and you've got hundreds of millions of people who believe this stuff because mainstream, mainstream pseudo-science has now picked it up, the truther community is running with it on, then, I mean, yeah, I'm offended. I'm offended because you're ignoring, you're doing the one thing that Charles Fort said that the guilty always do. You're practicing exclusions. And who wouldn't be a prize marksman if only their hits were recorded? Yeah, man. Charles Charles Ford was a man before his time. So, uh, hey, I need, to, I need to change topics because I just went on a rant. I lost myself in a rant. I'm sorry about that. Let's see. Earth is a ship. Earth might be a construct, but we might be in a ship. Hey, we get a lot of, pro uh, uh, Aisha Day Avalon, we get a lot of, I have it in my Chronicon, I go into a lot of detail about the origin of the Huns and the origin of the Burgundians and the, and the Haruli and the, the Jutes and the Angles and the Saxons and like, like, a lot, lot, lot of, a lot of misinformation in, in people, people think that the European pedigrees are real vastly separated and they're not when you go back 2000 years you find the same groups they just later splintered and went to ge different geographical areas even the animosity of the germans and the french you would think they're to totally different races of people but they're not they're different cultures and culture has everything to do with what you've been through, where you live, and who you've come in contact with. But the, the original French people were Francs. The Francs were a German clan. They, they were ruled by the Morovians. The Morovian dynasty going all the way back to, to, before Charles Martel and the Germans and the Prussians and the Burgundians and the Haruli and the Angles and the Jutes and the Sacks, all these people and many more that I'm not mentioning all, all around Europe, they're from the same ancient family. They just arrived in Europe at different times. The Celts and the Gauls are from the same ancient family. So what, you, what we have here is before 
this this pedigree of you can call them white people, you can call them Caucasians, whatever whatever your preference is. I'm not going to get into the Jewish endorsed, uh, uh, what is it? I, I I can't say narrative, but the Jewish endorsed endorsed sensitivity. Uh, uh, I'm not into that political bullshit. I'm not. I'm gonna call spade a spade. I don't care what you call white people, Caucasians, or uh, you have different reasons why you can't call them Caucasians because that just means Caucasus Mountains. Right? It's, it's, we're communicating here. So we're trying to find the lowest common denominators b- by which we can all understand something and remove the political BS. So I'm talking about white people. When they entered into Europe, they found an indigenous culture here. The Vikings, the Nordics called them Skralings. Now, these people are the of the original Iberian stock, according to academia. They were very short of stature. They were not like Caucasians, but they were like dark Caucasoid, just like the earlier Australians were and the Dravidians were, a dark-skinned race of people that did have Caucasian blood. Now, these people were all over the Mediterranean. They were all over Europe. Uh, they were, might, might have been in ancient Iceland as well. But these I- Iberian stock people had a rich history of traditions, and they were basically living in, in shanties. And they weren't even civilized enough to have villages. They just lived as fisher folk, and uh, they mainly stayed on the, in the hills or on the, on the coast. They weren't husbandmen. Uh, they weren't into husbandry. Um, very Neolithic in, in their lifestyle. Then these waves of Caucasians, white people, came in to the area. So we have, we have a merging of different cultures. There was intermarriage. There was full, full merging of racial, racial merging to where they became one people, resulting in what we have today spread throughout Europe. These people. Now, this is why there's such such diversity all throughout Europe. Now, the Huns were very, very, uh, uh, at one time, the Huns were very, very Caucasian looking. They were just like the Burgundians and the other, other families that had migrated from the, from the Russian steppes and from Central Asia into greater Europe. Now, the stories we have of the invasions of giants and the Tuatha Dei Dana, the stories, many of the ancient traditions that we have from Europe, they weren't from, they're not the traditions of the invaders. They're the traditions of the invaded. They are the traditions, they are from the perspective of a very short, swarthy skinned people. And they were remembered, they remembered these great massive giants that got off these ships and built these castles and fortresses and dolmens and rings, stone rings. And and they were in fascination of these people. And after hundreds of years, these traditions were, were preserved. After thousands of years, the stories and traditions and myths are carried over, even though the pedigree of the people that told them is gone. It is completely assimilated into the invaders. Now the invaders are carrying stories that are more ancient than they are. And this is the story around the world. This is what, this is what, why the archaic's data is so different than everybody else's that you come in contact with. I have gone back into those original narratives and separated fact from fiction and showed over and over and over in Chronicon the the differences between original lore and traditions that were that were known by indigenous peoples and then how those same legends and lore and traditions and histories were transferred through time but by the very people that did the invading yes this is this has everything to do with why the whole anunnaki story never happened in sumer it was by the time by the time the Sumerian cities were built, the Anuna were gone. The great cataclysm had already happened, and the the descendants the of the survivors created the Anunnaki narrative, which isn't anything like the original Anuna. So we have this over and over and over. Even in the Americas, we find this with Viracocha and Votan and Bokika. We find it with Quetzalcoatl. We find this great, massive Caucasian white people on, on ships, this great maritime empire, technologically advanced, and they show up in these ancient American areas. 
And when they and when they do, they 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 come as benefactors. There's no negative. There's no there's no negative traditions and negative memories about the most ancient appearances of these people. They came bringing like like alms and gifts and and and, and the, they they taught people how to farm and build pyramid cities and do all this. It was only later in history that when they came back that it was a, it was a, it was a different ball game. Now they came back as invaders long after their their original civilizations had collapsed into ruin be it from cataclysms, from Phoenix phenomenon, or from their departure and the inf infrastructure just collapsed after they left. So, yeah, it's, <clears throat> I don't even remember what the original question was. I just went off. You guys know I'm famous for my tangents and YouTube's not letting me go any higher. So that means I'm pretty far down. Hmm. Oh, that was about the Huns. The Huns, yes. The Huns are a part of the Caucasian human family. A lot of them do look a little bit different because they had a greater, they they assimilated more of the I, people of Iberian stock. Excuse me, the Skralings. A more ancient people that were already in Europe way before the arrival of the modern day white person, modern day Caucasian. Yeah, this is a, my Anuna files has triggered a lot of people, but I, I take nothing from it. The oldest traditions in the world are very, very clear. And they are all from the perspective of non-Caucasian people. And they all tell the same story. And I've documented this so much in the Anuna files. The story is very clear. The ancient world knew of no white people. And then suddenly when white people, white people showed up, that's when we have all these historical calendars, all this infrastructure. That's when we have all these, all these amazing appearances of the gods. No, they weren't gods, they were humans but they were godlike because of the technologies they brought. This is the story found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's actually the story of Genesis. Genesis, Genesis has just been watered down a whole lot. You got to find the clues. And when it comes to the Scythians, man, you're talking about a people that, there was like what? 31 different subcultures of the Scythians. The Scythians were never one people. It's almost like a geographical region for a bunch of different types of, a bunch of different white people, but uh, called by all, all different names. Low Rider. They claim they found a chariot wheel in the Red Sea when the Red Sea was parted. Listen, I've read that book. I've read every single thing that Ron Wyatt published. All right. I believe I have. He's even got pamphlets that I've read that were not that were not books. They're just stapled together. I used to write Ron Ronald Wyatt. I used to write when he was alive. In fact, his family sent me a letter when he had passed away. Now, do I believe he found the Ark of the Covenant beneath Gol Gol Golgotha? Absolutely not. I have reasons for believing that. Do I believe he think he may have found a chamber that had artifacts in it and, and the Israeli government? basically escorting him out of the country and they took over the archaeological site? Absolutely, I believe that. I don't believe the man would have lied willingly, but I believe he jumped to conclusions. Golgotha is not found anywhere in the original Christian text. Golgotha seems to be 100% invented to add to the gospel narrative. There was no Golgotha place known anywhere in the ancient world. So it's not mentioned anywhere. It's exclusive to the church. So, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not uh, buying it. I'm not buying it. There has not been an unbroken tourist industry in Jerusalem and Israel. The Crusades, Muslim occupations, the occupations of the Moors and the Saracens, the Arabs. There's there's been times when Jerusalem was absolutely empty of Jews, em empty of Christians, and there's no way that any of those sites are the original places. And there's many scholars today that are in agreement with that. These are places that were picked in the last four and five hundred years and assigned those names. We're going to call this this. We think this is Golgotha. And we think this right here might have been Temple Mount. We think this right here might have been the old temple. This could have been Bathsheba's well right here. They don't know. They have no idea because we don't even know if many of those stories were actually historical. So, yeah, it's... I'm not buying it about, about the, the wrong white. Now, when it comes to the chariot wheels in the Red Sea, might have been a chariot wheel. 
There might have been chariots in the Red Sea. The Red Sea disappearing and then coming back is not something that is novel to the Exodus story. In my Chronicon, I show two other incidents where the Mediterranean had moved, which, which connected to the Red Sea. It had moved because the North African plate goes up and down. In, 22, in 2239 BC, it went down. When it did, the Mediterranean flooded in. When it went back up 340 years later and brought the pyramids out of the water and the Sphinx was now heavily damaged because it wasn't, it wasn't protected by the white limestone casing blocks that the pyramids had. Now the two temples, the, the Valley Temple and the Temple of the Sphinx, they're completely buried and nobody even knew about them for thousands of years. They're buried there because the Mediterranean came back up. Totally entombed those temples. They weren't even discovered until the 1920s, 1930s. So these temples are excavated. Now here's the problem. Well, Napoleon, a matter, matter of fact, Napoleon discovered them. They weren't fully excavated until the 20s. So when the Mediterranean comes, the North African plate, is it goes through an earthquake, upheaval brings it back up. Now we have the creation of the Egyptian Nile. In ancient times, it was the Nine Bows. It was called the Goshen region. This is where the old, the old Amuru colonies were that were ruling in Lower Egypt. The Bible calls them Israelites. Nowhere in the historical record can you find Israelites because they were never called Israelites in history. They were called by other names, and those names have been found in the historical record. One of them is Bit Omri, which means the house of Omri. In other, other cultures, like the Assyrians, couldn't pronounce it. They called them Bit Kumri or Bat Kumri, the house of Omri. So these, these are the people that became uh, uh, your Simri, your Sumeria. I'm not talking about Sumerians. It's spelled different. I'm talking about C-I-M-M-E-R. These are Scythian branches of people. But yeah, it's a lot of research by Raymond, by, uh, uh, Raymond Capt, Frederick Haberman, Tracing Our Ancestors is one of the greatest books to read on, on, on this. And I'm sure there's others that I'm, I'm not aware of. But, uh, uh, there's a guy named Dankenbring who puts all these histories together and shows you all the mig migration patterns and all that too. But yeah, this... The event itself of an army being being swallowed could have definitely entered the historical web record if an earthquake would have happened while while a military was passing over that area. Yeah, I agree. It could have definitely happened. It could have definitely happened at the Exodus when the Israelites were fleeing, although they were called the Amuru at the time, and they're also called the Tamahu. Egyptian monuments call them the Tamahu, and it shows them as like two heads taller than everybody else and very pale white skin, called the Tamahu. But uh, and uh, Tamahu's based off Talmai. Talmai is found in the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, Talmai was uh one of the sons of Anak. Anak was the son of Noah, or son of Arab. Arab was the son of Noah, but he was the son of Noah after the cataclysm. Remember, Noah was Uranus, the Titan. The Titans were the ray, were humans that were born under the vapor canopy. They didn't consider themselves as gigantic. They had sons and daughters after the cataclysm when the vapor canopy had collapsed. Their sons and daughters were the giants, nowhere near as big uh, as the Titans were. So now the Titans realize how big they are when they see their sons and daughters, the giants. But the giants themselves only gave birth to regular sized humans. So within one, within two generations, while they were all living at the same time, right after the great cataclysm of 2239 BC caused by the Phoenix phenomenon, we have the collapse of the vapor canopy introducing a generation that knew titans, giants, and normal sized humans all living on the earth at the same time. And this is the background story to the, to the birth of Gilgamesh, well, anciently called Bilgamesh. You know, you know of him as Nimrod of the of Genesis, Nimrod of the Bible. Let's see here, and on the on the Euphrates drying up, I don't know what the what, I don't know if that was induced. I don't know if somebody somebody in the elite uh, engineers got together and did something to divert the water to make make the Christian world panic about. Oh, this is the end times. Remember, guys, I told you. 
that before the Phoenix phenomenon can occur, we have to expect an artificial apocalypse. A fake version of the apocalypse is going to happen before the Phoenix phenomenon occurs. This is the story of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Every one of the, all these events have nothing to do with the oversoul. They have nothing to do with angels. They have nothing to do with supernatural events. The first four seals, the first four horsemen of the apocalypse are all human developments. Humans cause all this stuff. It's a false apocalypse before the real one starts. Yeah, it's a, so, so the drawing up of the Euphrates could be, could be manufactured just to give, it, give the Christian world the idea that that's exactly what's happening. An apocalypse is about to happen. It, it's, it's the times. Yep, no doubt. Do you follow Michael Sala and his research on the Galactic Federation? That's all you had to say was Galactic Federation. I'm already, all, I'm already not on board. I'm not, I'm not on board with channeled materials. I'm not on board with anything I can't verify. I'm not on board with, uh, we have hundreds of spaceships, spaceships uh, outside our orbit. Uh, the, Ple the Pleiadians are our, our star brothers and sisters, and they're here to rescue us. And all, and all that's, to me, it's all PSYOP. It's, uh, to me, I mean, as long as the enemy, the elite, can make you believe that you have help coming, you'll never help yourself. As long as they can make you believe that in the collective, there is a war that you can have some type of control over the outcome, then they've won. Because you're living in two different realities. And one is the personal, and that's where you're a god. That's where you are a goddess. That is where you have absolute control of where you are and how the collective will affect you. And the other one is the collective. And the collective has all kinds of weird belief systems that have absolutely no evidence to substantiate them. You know, no, I'm not, I'm not on board with the Galactic Federation. None of that. All the channeled materials can't. No, I'm not, I'm not on board with them at all. People ask me about Dolores Cannon. You know what? Dolores Cannon can, can do uh, a thousand videos and say a thousand different things and do whatever she wants. She's claiming these are channeled materials or whatever. There's nothing I can verify. Now, can you find value in all these presentations? No, I don't know. It's not anything that I'm, you're asking me. I'm not trying to transpose my belief system onto you. You're asking me what I value. And I'm telling you, I value none of those things. I don't, because even with my last video on the tarot, I don't value tarot. Do I see that value can be derived from it? Yeah, you can get some value out of it. It all depends on what your faith in the individual is. Because I don't believe in the system. I don't believe in any system. It's always the man, never the method. This is why there's so many different systems of occult philosophy. There's so many different methods of divining. I look, dowsing rods. I don't believe the dowsing rod has any power on itself. It is an antenna that is of great faculty to someone who believes in it, and they can use it that way. The occult works in that, in that means. Everything is a conduit, but you have to be the creator of that system or have a faith invested in your ability to produce the desired effects in that system. So I'm not. I'm not a believer in any of these things. I believe it's the individual. And I can have faith in individuals if they show me a track record. But yeah, it's a... Uh, no. Galactic Federation is an excellent way to get people in the truther community to believe that, that there is a space up there that can be explored. Because Galactic and Feder Federation infers that we have been to the moon. Because we claim to have been to the moon. Therefore, it's possible to get to the moon. Galactic Federation implies that we can travel to space, that we can go out there and do it. Now, I've lost friends behind this. Yeah, for, I've lost admins. I've lost moderators to groups. I have lost personal friends over some, over some of my beliefs, but I still stand behind them. I personally think that there's something wrong with you if you believe that the technology we had in 1969 ever put humans on the moon. There's something wrong with you. The Russians never tried because they knew they burned up their dogs. They burned up their monkeys. They knew nothing biological can pass through the Van Allen belt. They knew that. So they didn't even try the deception. But NASA did. NASA put all that information out there. Then Nixon got on a phone, talked to one of the astronauts on the moon. Come on, man. The, the, 
every bit of it was staged. None of that crap they show at NASA could have ever done the things that they say it done. Those rockets and propulsion, even the manifest on NASA didn't have camera equipment. They've published every single thing that was on board those, those capsules and those landers and rockets. They published them all. And one thing they never took was lighting equipment. So they can't justify how there's double, there's double shadows in the negatives on a lot of those photographs. If the sun is the only source of illumination, why do you have two shadows? Listen, is there, there's so many, but it doesn't even matter. All that's, all that's optics anyway. It's all, what, what matters is that all the important people that spoke out about it were silenced. That should tell you something. So, yeah, it's, William Cooper talked about it. It killed him. Stanley Kubrick talked about it. A whole bunch of people have. Yeah, it's just, no. I'm not, I'm not on board with the Galactic Federation. It's again, again, it boils down to, okay, do you believe in the man at 7-Eleven? And do you believe that that man is going to charge you for whatever you take off those shells before you walk out that door in 7-Eleven? Okay, terrible analogy, but you can follow my reasoning. I believe in that man in 7-Eleven. Because I've been to 7-Eleven, and I know if I take something off the shelves, he's watching me on camera, and he's going to make sure he asks me to pay for that before I walk out that door. I believe in that. I have faith that I'm going to end up paying for something if I go to that 7-Eleven. This is objectivity. I've experienced it. I know about it. I can talk about it. When you talk about the Galactic Federation, you are relying on a source as being truthful because there isn't anybody listening to my voice right now has ever seen any of these Pleiadians in person, has ever had a conversation with them in person. Everything is channeled, therefore, by virtue of imagination. Yeah, I'm not buying none of that Dolores Cannon crap. I'm not buying none of that Galactic Federation stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with the truth as I objectively have discovered it with a calculator or in my research and writings or, or cognitive leaps that I can demonstrate for you and you can follow and jump from lily pad to lily pad with me. We'll be little frogs discovering this world together. But you're not going to have me entertain some BS about some aliens that, are, that have our best interest and they keep giving news reports all over YouTube. The Galactic Federation has now said that, guys, y'all need to hold on. We got big things happening. Uh, you won't be able to catch your breath when the next big event happens. Well, you know, that's, pre- that's, that's pretty vague because I'm pretty sure a lot of people can't catch their breath when the next big event happens. It's, it's a big event. So, yeah, it's, it's no, I'm not buying none of it. No one has seen, no one listening to my voice has ever seen a capital ship shuttle come from space and land in their backyard and people get out and say, hey, check this out. Uh, I'm such and such, such and such from the world, such and such, I'm Pleiadian, this guy, he's Arcturian and all that. Uh, uh, We just want to let you know. What makes you so important that that a galactic federation had had to come down here, send a ship, talk to you? Did they give you permission to put that material on YouTube? It can it become the more you think about it and the more you chase these ideas, it becomes ridiculous. Galactic Federation, if it truly existed, would only be in communication with those that it needed to be in communication with to do whatever it did. And if these ships were all seen, why haven't they be seen, be, be, been seen by, by everybody? The entire idea of Galactic Federation implies the very deception that NASA perpetuates that we are not in a containment field and that there's a vast cosmos that we can explore, but we cannot. So no, I'm not, I'm not buying it. Sorry. Uh, I hope I haven't offended you, but that's child play. All the stuff across YouTube I'm seeing, that's, that's adult. That's adults pretending to be, they're trying to go back to their childish roots again. I want to talk about Pleiadians. I want to talk about Arcturians and all these different uh, extraterrestrial species. You want to talk about, yeah, it's just, it's not, it's, it's nuts is what it is. It's, it's time to grow up. Uh, if I lose subs over that, so be it. But you're never, ever going to be able to call me on my phone and say, hey, Jason, check this out. I know you have strong feelings about this, but this Pleiadian's over here right now. I invited her over for dinner. And uh, here, uh, I'm not even going to send you a picture. You just need to come over here, man, and introduce yourself, man. And she'll tell you all about the Galactic Federation and all that. Yeah, okay. You might have some knockout blonde six foot tall over there with with steel gray eyes sitting in your living room ready ready to feed me a bunch of bullshit. But she's not Pleiadian. I'm not trying to hear that. Yeah. Okay, let me move on. 
starting to sound more like a rant. So the chariot wheel and the Red Sea deal could very well be true. Now, are we going to attach that to the Exodus story? We can, and it might be true. I don't have a problem with following your reasoning on why you asked me that question. Could it be the result that part of the Exodus story is absolutely true? I'm going to say yes. Why am I going to say yes? Not because of anything that was found in the Bible, because that was through Jewish filters. I'm going to say yes because the same story is found in a book that academia is trying to bury. The same story is found in a text from the old world that is very, very specific, but it's completely devoid of the supernatural. I'm going to agree with you because I have read the account of the Colburn Bible, and I was really floored by how similar this whole story was of the Exodus, but it's not presented through a Jewish filter. That was shocking to me when I read the Colburn Bible. I even have a video about it. Because in the Colburn Bible, the phoenix is called the doom shape. And that makes sense. Oh, thank you, Zara 138. So, uh, sooner or later, I was going to see that 138 somewhere. Listen, that's, that's a, uh, yes, I can agree that that did happen. And, and I agree that the Israelites fled, but they weren't called Israelites at the time because the historical record called them Hyksos, which was derogatory. This is what the Egyptians called them. They never called themselves the Hyksos. Hyksos has been sanitized to be shepherd kings, but it's also, to the Egyptians, it was foreign kings, and it was derogatory. Derogatory to the point that if they have called them Hyksos to their face, they might have got arrested. But, uh, oh, I must have a package being delivered. Somebody told me they're sending me some books. My dogs do not let anything happen. I can't look at my cameras because it'll mess up my YouTube settings. Ordinar ordinarily, I have a square right here on the left of my my my, my computer. It shows it shows all six cameras all over my property. I can see everything, but when I, but only when I'm on YouTube, I can't see anything. I can't. I tried that once before, and I completely cut cut my my upload off. I'm I'm tech disadvantaged, guys. So yeah, lowrider. I can agree that a chariot wheel was found in the old test. In the, in the, I saw those pictures in Ron Wyatt's book. They were convincing. Not just chariot wheels. It showed chariots laying on their side that had been buried in coral, proving that they they were there for a very long period of time. So yeah, I'm on board with that. I don't. Okay, Michael Sala and his research on the Galactic Federation. Yeah, I'm not. Now, when it comes to Galactic Federation, I, I do want. I want to point something out, guys. Ninety percent of everything considered satanic, ninety percent of everything considered mystical or the occult today, cannot be traced to anything prior to the Golden Dawn Society. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Prior to the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, what we consider the occult and mystical today didn't exist. Now, this Galactic Federation and all that, how far does it go back? What historical documents can we, can we pull up that ever admit to anything about a Galactic Federation? I'm not buying it. Not buying it. But if you're a member of the Galactic Federation, and you're listening to my YouTube channel right now, you're listening to me run my mouth, listen, by all means, prove me wrong. Viva Las Veggies. That is such a great name. Viva Las Veggies. You don't need to read, you don't need to read the Bible, but I advise everybody to read the New Testament at least once in their life. I know a lot of people don't have time to read the whole Bible. It's huge. But you should read the New Testament at least once in your life. Some of the things Jesus said are absolutely profound. All right. Any opinion of the George Washington prophecy, its authenticity and relevance? Operation End Times, please send me an email and educate me on what you're talking about. I have read the Congressional Globes, the Congressional Annals, and the Congressional Records. I have read Dr. John Coleman's books that reveal the contents of all these extraordinary documents, these compilations of letters from Thomas Paine and Jefferson and both, both Adams, uh, Washington, uh, 
uh, oh, even Benjamin Franklin, the, the writings of the founding fathers were very prophetic. They knew who the enemy was, and they published this over and over in those writings. They wanted to warn future Americans who you need to watch out for on the international scene. And later, the very people they warned us about have taken over the entertainment industry. They took over the banking industry. They took over the media. Yeah, the Everything the founding fathers said has come to pass. So, I'm saying that because you, you're mentioning if I have an opinion on the George Washington prophecy, and I'm going to admit to you right now that you have me at a, at a loss. I don't know of a George Washington prophecy. So please educate me on that. Send me an email. Yeah, I would like to. I would definitely like to know more about that. Science saying that dogs seeing black and white is a crock. I can believe that. They probably see color too. Maybe not, not Maybe not the full spectrum we see, but I have a problem with colors. Yeah, I, I, I have a huge problem with colors. Even today, I can't I can't really identify. Yeah, it's, just, it's all it's old. Didn't even know I was colorblind until I think fifth grade or sixth grade. They uh, they showed me a pie chart in school. And what happened was there was a, I already, man, I already told you guys this in another video, but there was a show in the eighties. I can't remember, but it, but it was no whammies, no whammies, no whammies. And you take a big old hammer and you hit this woodchuck or this, this, this animal coming out of this hole and you had to hit it fast enough. And it was, and the main thing they were always saying was no whammies, no way. Well, answers and, and things in that game show were color coded. And I kept saying, I, I kept saying things that were off and, my mother caught it, and she's like, "Man, she had me tested." We went to school, and they showed me a a a, a, a pie chart, and I kind of felt insulted, but I was proud that I knew. I know that's red, that's yellow, that's blue, that's green. Got it perfect, no problem here. So, I did notice though that there was blurring, but I thought that's the way it was supposed to be. There was blurring between the yellow, green, blue, and red. I see the primaries just fine. That's not what colorblindness is. You don't see, colorblind people don't see in black and white. But I found out real quick that I have a problem because my eyes don't see the spectrum. I don't see, I see, I saw the blur in between yellow, green, blue, and red. It was blurry between each one. I didn't know that there was 12 colors on that chart. I thought there were four. So, yeah. That's when I found out, like fourth or fifth grade, when they had my eyes tested. Let's see. Looking for another question. Yeah, Operation End Times. I'm pretty interested in that. You got you got my curiosity peaked. Mary Orseski. The very fact that the Emerald Tablets promotes an Atlantis at 35,000 years ago tells me the entire document is falsified. It's of modern provenance, and there are no ancient copies. So I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to say that the Emerald Tablets is also BS, just like a lot of these a lot of the modern modern mystical documents that have been surfacing. Oh no, there's nothing. 35,000 years ago is way too long, but. My archaics veterans already know. You already know the day count systems correct everything. Atlantis was the 14th century BC. It couldn't have been 35,000 BC because there was no Greek to fight. They were in a war with Greece. There were no Egyptians around to record these events. The Egyptians existed at that time too. So according to the narrative of Plato, so Atlantis has to be fit into a historical context where it would be existing at the time that the Greeks or the Proto-Greeks uh, existed. And we do have a time period. The ancestors of the Greeks were the Mycenaeans and the, and the people of Argos and Achaia. And Atlantis did exist at that time, but it was the 14th century BC, not 35,000 BC. Christine C on the UK video, I did the isometric projections were all was was all I really did because there's not a 
Yeah, it's the events of 1974 as they pass over in 1973 was the only thing I looked at for the UK predictions as they are filtered through the pivot year, which is 1998. So it's it's like a triad. What happened in 1998 compared with ni- with the very end of 70, uh, I mean, with the very beginning of 74 and the end of 1973, that period right there is how the UK predictions deal was put out. Now, when it comes to these predictions, a lot of the times the the phenomena is general, although then the prediction I provide something very specific, such as the fact that these predict that, that the, uh, the controversy is over coal mining. Okay, well, this is actually mining for a natural resource. I said coal mining because in the isometric projections, this is what the controversy was in 73 and 74. But the isometric parallel unfolding at the end of 2022 and toward the beginning of 2023 would basically mean it would translate as some type of natural resource controversy. It wouldn't necessarily have to be coal. So it's reflected. But it's, sometimes the particulars are, aren't, aren't the same, but the phenomena is. So, yeah, it's uh, just wait and see. That's all. Wait and see. I don't know what you mean, Deb Wirtz. Are you trying to solve the pyramid puzzle? I've got 50 videos in my uh, Lost Secrets of Giza where I think I've pretty much put together a whole bunch of it. If you haven't seen those videos... Uh, I have I have material in my Giza playlist that you won't find in any other pyramid. Re, yeah, you won't find any of this data. Yeah, it's 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 unique. It's unique. Don't don't take my word for it. Read the comments in those videos in that playlist. Yeah, that's the the Great Pyramid is fantastic, but I'm not finding anybody publishing the truth about it. What's really been found? Now there are people who have who have definitely published a lot of truth about what they have found, although they don't go into the his- history of it. But Christopher Dunn, yeah, looking at it from an engineering and scientific pr- perspective, he has I- isolated many truths about the Great Pyramid and how it was machined and how it is a machine. I like Christopher Dunn, no doubt. But my favorite engineer overall who has studied the Great Pyramid was from the 1920s, Davidson. You know, I've read his books and, and, uh, I cited him many times. Let's see. Live government feeds can be false via green rooms. Yes, they can. 100%. Yes, they can. Cosmic rhythms. Did this event, HV, oh, did, did this, you abbreviate, okay, acronym. Did this event have any significance with Phoenix? On 10 April 1815, Tambora produced the largest eruption known uh, known on the planet during the past 10,000 years. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. First of all, I had nothing to do with the Phoenix phenomenon. Many events have, have happened that are not on the, the Phoenix phenomenon deal. But when it comes to Mount Tambora, first of all, we haven't been recording events like this but in the last 200 years. There's no way that scientists could ever assert that the Mount Tambora was the largest eruption known in the last 10,000 years. Other scientists will tell you differently that we're in Italy researching the Avellino eruption. They they made the same claims. They said, no, oh, this is the biggest eruption in the history of man ever. So, yeah, it's a, now, I believe that in 1815 that the volcano erupted but many volcanoes in history have erupted. One erupted in 522 that sent the whole world into a blanket of darkness for a long time, and that was a Phoenix year. Phoenix does cause a lot of volcanism, but volcanoes have been going on like Vesuvius that have nothing to do with the Phoenix phenomenon at all. Oh, best adult dating site. They're in the chat. Thank you, Mish Mish Gleason, getting, getting rid of them. Charles Winters tipster. When do you think World War III will start? Well, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now, my friends, is not World War III. All right? World War III is scripted just like World War II was, just like World War I was. The script may have been written way back in history that we don't know about, but it first came to the public attention in the 1880s when that script was published. So, I go into detail in other videos about that. It's all. 
it was in a Masonic doc document how the three world wars would go down. And uh, it's actually the dude that, that wrote it was, is the, I can't remember, but his, his name is the origin for the word that we have today of mafia. But uh, yeah, I have that all in a video. It's pretty interesting history, but world war three is going to be over Jerusalem. World war three is going to be Western Christian nations fighting against Islam. That's what World War Three World War is. But the events that are going on in the United States and other Western countries right now are setting the stage for that. We just haven't got there yet. There's still some more manipulations to do. But nationalists and conservatives are going to be taking back their countries. They already are right now. And uh, it's going to set the stage for World War Three. There's going to be, there's going to be a, a lot of of controversy promoted by by the establishment it's all going to be false flags in between islam and christianity and it's going to build up toward toward a crescendo when islamic nations go and take jerusalem this is what this is the script this is what we're waiting on now the, these events should be unfolding pretty pretty rapidly in the next two to three years you're going to see it Yes, when a pole shift occurs, the Great Pyramid in Egypt is the epicenter. Safest place in the world. Uh, Connor McDory, isn't he the guy that writes a lot of really fascinating old Irish books showing how the uh, Irish roots to civilization going? I mean, I can't, I can't contend that because Ireland does boast of Newgrange. Ireland boasts of uh, several places. Is that Silbury Hill or is that in England? Ireland has a lot of evidence of an infrastructure that goes back to 31 and the 31st and 32nd BC. That's before the Great Pyramids were built. So uh, I can't contend that at all. I need to read his books though. I do need to read his books. Hey, Face Diaper. I see you keeping it PG today. Jeremy X, what are the origins of so-called black people? Well, I will tell you this. There is evidence that they've been on all the continents in the ancient times. And there's a lot of evidence that before white people ever entered in, into this world in the historical record, there was black people everywhere already. Now, we also have annals such as like uh, the Incan king, Taku, Taku Paki. I can't remember his name. I got him, I got him in Chronicon. But Takupaki the fourth, it's like Tupac, Taki Tupac the fourth, something like that. It's spelled just like Tupac, but it's it's Tupac Tupac Kuti or Tupac Kuti the fourth, an Inca king in his annals. He fought a war against a massive army of invading blacks, and this was in South America in the fifth or sixth century A.D. That's amazing. Where'd they come from? The whole army, you know, they were—they were even astonished. It's—it's in the—it's in the Inca Inca records, I believe. It was recorded by Montesinos, Monte Montesinos, whatever his name is. But yeah, that's. And then we have then we have uh, amazing, amazing reliefs and statuary and traditions from Central America, Oaxia, Veracruz state, uh, the old Olmec uh, sites and stuff uh, of where. Caucasians and African looking blacks are tied together and executed together after the end of a war when the Caucasians and the blacks were in the same army and they were fighting against locals in central Mexico and the native Americans of central Mexico overcame the Caucasians and blacks. And we have reliefs of of white people and black people chopped up all together, body parts everywhere. Yeah, these are in the books of David Hatcher Childers. Nothing I made up. Yeah, this is ancient times. A lot of blacks here in the Americas. All right, let's see. So I can't answer, Jeremy X, I can't answer your question. You're asking me, what are the origins of so called black people? Couldn't tell you, bro. Just couldn't tell you. I do know that uh, we see them in the historical record in places that you wouldn't imagine. It's just like, how the hell? I've never heard that before, but here it is. So.
it's been a while since I spent time with a tree, but then again, it all depends on my whole property is covered in trees. I'm always leaning against them, but I but but I know what you're referring to. You're referring to my video on the trees. I haven't done that in a while. Greg Berry, I don't know anything about Star Forts. Uh, before I realized that there was some Tartarian controversy connection to the idea of star forts i thought those were phoenician or carthaginian fortresses and i thought that they were built in that way because it makes it very difficult for an invader to storm the castle when you don't have a flat wall it's easy to assault a flat wall it's very difficult to assault a sharply pointed wall because that makes your enemy come in closer and men from the walls can 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 basically just aim down and you'll always hit somebody you don't have to really aim. You just drop your rocks, drop your weapons, drop your iron bars, shoot your arrows, shoot your slings, whatever, into those niches because the enemy has to force themselves into those those spear points. So I thought that they were built for defendable. Uh, they, they were built by a, a sophisticated people like Phoenicians or Carthaginians or Libyans, which were the sailors of the ancient world. So I thought that's what it was, that these were badass, impregnable fortresses, fortresses built from European countries when they came to the Americas so they could have a place of protection against the millions of people that were in the Americas. But like I said, I could be wrong. I mean, shoot, I've been wrong before, but uh, I'm always going to, I'm always going to choose the lesser of uh, uh, like Occam's razor. If there's a lot of wild theories I can entertain, but there's a simple solution, I'm going to go with the simple solution until a wild theory overturns it every time. Have you considered having a small study group for people in your area? Hmm. I haven't considered it, no. I mean, I could. I could definitely do it. But then again, would I have time? I'm always... I'm always moving. I don't know. Might, might be a good idea. But it would be one that I would have to, you know, to maximize on the experience and on the time, I would probably film it so we could we could put those study groups on YouTube. That's a pretty smart idea. I like that idea. That was Leslie Thompson. What time period does this scripture reference in Matthew refer to? Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days have been cut short. Okay, the second trump trumpet judgment. This is truly the apocalypse. This is not the seven seals. Listen, this question is very interesting. The date is post-2046. That that prophecy is because it's in 2046, return of the Nemesis X object, 2046, prime date of, uh, uh, it is the end of the Mayan long count. And the Maya, Mayan prophecy says that at the end of the 13th Bacton, time will collapse beneath the 13th heaven. There was 13 heavens. So time collapsing, meaning time is going to change. Remember, this was attached to an ancient calendar, which started with a cataclysm when time changed. So 2046 is the date. We know this by many, many different other parallels, which I've given you guys, which is the whole chronology of the Nemesis X object, which, which identifies 2046. Also, on the ancient world's calendar, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God from the sky, the angel of death in the sky in 2046, Annus Mundi which was our calendar, 1849 B.C. So 2046, and you guys all know Die Hold, the Die Hold Foundation. Uh, Douglas Voigt, he also promotes 2046 for different reasons um, as a pole shift date. And a pole shift would necessarily change time if it added or deleted days. But in the second trumpet judgment of the book of Revelation, it's very clear. The result of this judgment is that one third of the day, one third of the night, one third of the stars, one third of the sun, and one third of the moon would be reduced by a third. If you take out 33% of the year, 
you're left with 243 days. If you take out 33% of the day, you're left with 16 hours. So what we have here in 2046 with the return of the Nemesis X object is a vast destruction on, on an apocalyptic level, which will ruin many of the cities that are deemed by God to be destroyed or whoever, the oversoul. It said, but what the effect of this cataclysm in 2046 is that our sky is going to be moving faster so that a day is no longer 24 hours, it's 16 hours. Eight hours are removed, one third. Now, additionally, the year will not be 365.25 days anymore. It will be reduced to 243 or 242.5, something like that. So it's reduced to a third. So if the day itself, let's say, well, let's just say we're on a globe. If the day itself is now 16 hours and, and the year is now 243 Time is abbreviated. Unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. Remember, 2040 brings back the vapor canopy in all unique conditions that we read about in 2nd Esdras and in the prophetic literature of, of, of the Bible. It's very interesting time, as in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, it was a vapor canopy. The great flood was caused by what? The collapse of the vapor canopy. 2040 2040 begins the new vapor canopy. Now, all these changes come on the human family. Things are very different in the six years, lead, six and a half years leading up to 2046. Then the event in 2046 that happens. The Nemesis X object crashes from the sky and lands and hits North America. When this occurs in 2046, in November 1st, 2046, or November 2nd, depending upon where you are in the world, when this happens, it's going to accelerate time. The quickening begins. Now, we have an increased change in, 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 in the human... Uh, uh, however, our environment affects us on a genetic level. Whatever, whatever latent DNA sequences that are dormant may be activated when the vapor canopy is here. But even more may be activated or perverted when the vapor canopy is here and the increase increase spin rate of our world. Whether it's a flat disk or it's a globe, it doesn't matter. The stellosphere will be moving faster. And this is going to change th things on a biological level. It's going to change animal behavior. It's going to change weather patterns. It's going to change everything. So may increase volcanism and ambient radiation. May we the, the apocalypse is about a great changes. Now, this is the time. You asked me that all your question is when when is the prophecy going to be filled as far as chronologically? That's the time. 2046 is when the quickening happens. Time is abbreviated. In 2046, we have 60 more years until the return of the chief cornerstone in the year 6000. 6,000 since the new heavens and new earth of 3895 BC. 60 years, though, isn't the true length of the apocalypse. Because with one third removed from the day and one third removed from the year, that means 20 full years are taken off the timeline and even a third of that 20. Meaning the apocalypse is a very short period of time or everybody would die. So, this is a very, it's very interesting, good, very interesting question, but this, uh, my Chronicon project is undergoing right now, and I stopped Chronicon, the public version ends in 2012, where I explain that the Mayan long count does not end in 2012. That was my last entry. I finished Chronicon in 2012, so, but Chronicon. Chronicon goes all the way up to 2106. I have documented it all. And I have also compared the isometric projections with the past events leading up to those years. I have also cross-referenced all that material with the quatrains of Nostradamus as filtered through only the date index that was discovered by Mario Reading, which has been infallible. It's been awesome. So my Chronicon team is going to be writing all that new material that I have not shown you guys into the, the final version of Chronicon. They'll be getting to that pretty soon. Let's see. <clears throat> so, 
So, Casey Jones, what do you think about there being 573 Mercury orbits during a Phoenix period of 138 years and how Nabu, 573 Hebrew Gematria, Nabu, the Babylonian equivalent to Mercury? I think that's very interesting. As a matter of fact, I had never considered. I had never considered. Now you got me wondering if I need to go look at this. But I had never considered that the periodicities of the other wandering stars would be used as a unit of measurement to identify the 138-year period. Yeah. That. You did that. That. I'm about to get on top of that. Thank you. Wow. So, 138 years. I need to find out how many revolutions of each wandering star occurred in a 138-year period. I need to start with Mercury. I need to go to Venus. I need to go to Mars. I'm going to do that. That's my next study. I got to see. You You don't put me on to something. I got, I got to see because this could very well open up the meaning to a lot of numerical text in the cuneiform tablets that is that is so far never been uh, understood that's a really unique way of looking at something we know in the ancient world they called it the appen this is why in astronomy the zodiac is called the mu the mul appen but the appen was something separate from the mul appen the appen was a, a an anomaly that appeared every once in a while and it brought all kinds of phenomena. It's it's the phoenix. Appen is phoenix. Same thing we find in ancient Egypt as the pin deity. Same thing we find that the Greeks remembered as the phoenix. The pn is always there, like Typhon, Typhon, uh, Fenrir. It's all from. It's all all has its origin. My connection is unstable. I've been doing this for two hours. If I blot out, I got to notice that my connection is unstable. So. Anyway, thank you for putting me on game there, because I will definitely have a look at that. I will definitely have a look at that. Thank you guys for uh, smashing that like button. I appreciate that. That is going to have to be, I, I have mentioned retro causality before and remote viewing, but we need to, I, I should go deeper in that. That's from uh, Roto, Rotom Electric. Percival, 29710, do you think there is a such thing as a demonic realm? Please see my video, The Origin of Demons. John Fowler, that's a really good question. How come the BC dates of the Phoenix events are odd and the AD dates are even? Did I miss something in the Phoenix playlist? Uh, yes, I do show in one of those those playlists how the BC AD over uh, overlap because it, it was never linear. It was a mistake made a long time ago. But the Annus Mundi timeline, the AM dating is absolutely unbroken and it corrects that easily. You, all calculations I do forward and backward in time are, are using the AM dating because it's an unbroken timeline. AC and BC were fit together with the assumption that uh, one would back one and no one considered it, considered it as an integer where there would be a year zero. So it's a, in Chronicon, there's a perfect explanation and a demonstration showing you different calendars and how, how they go over the BC AD and how scholars were aware of this problem that uh, the church messed up when they designed the BC AD system. But the mistake had basically stayed there. But yeah, it's 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 easy. It's easy, it's easy to see. It's uh all you have to do, uh, all you have to do in Chronicon is look up one BC. If you look up 1 BC or 1 AD, one of them, it explains, shows you a chart and explains exactly how it works. Yeah, it's very easy. IRS Media. Have you guys considered putting some book money together? Buy the books with your money. <laughs> oh, we're doing pretty good, man. I'm doing all right. If I see books, I buy them. Johnny Quid, what do you guys think of Graham Hancock? 
Do you work for Graham Hancock? I am not impressed. Not impressed. Sheila Bells. Yeah, I'm, I'm firm that 1974 is the holographic year for 2022, but it's not the only one. Not the only one. It should be regarded through the filter of 1998. You can find others. I didn't go real deep, but you can you could play with 1962 uh, uh, too, and look at it and look at 1962 isometrically and see what years line up with uh, 1974 and 2022. You can play with the year 1902 as well and do the same thing. I just don't have time to do all that analysis. But yeah, I'm still, I'm still on board with nothing changed about that. In my predictions playlist, I've got a whole isometric chart you can follow about World War II and Civil War, forward and backward in time, uh, Trump's life. Anybody who would have been following Trump's life isometrically would have been able to easily predict that he was going to be president in 2016. And I showed that chart. It looks like a pyramid, forward and backward in time, each event. <laughs> Uh-oh, more data entries for Chronicon. Yep. I told you, Fifth Element. I told you on Discord. I've got all that stuff after 20, 2012. Chronicon's huge. Sonia Rhodes. Jason, I have volume 10 of messages and papers from the desk of the president, 1787 to 18. Well, I'm pretty sure it's got some awesome quotes in there. I know Dr. John Coleman has quoted extensively from a lot of those early presidential letters and uh, some of the things that you read in the Congressional glo uh, Globes, Annals, and Records would shock you by today's standards because you can't say many of the things that they said back then. Yeah, it's crazy. Not without having some type of uh, defamation organization on your ass. <laughs> Who are you? Charles Mazak, what are you talking about? Jason, the copyright is expired. Why not reproduce it and download it as a P? Oh, you're talking about that 1877 book? I will look into that because I will surely do that. If uh yes, 100 percent I'm 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 still excited about getting that book. So you're talking about the secret of lost races from 1877. Yes, I will most certainly do that. I will research the I will contact the, the Library of Congress and I will make sure that the that no one else has has uh, because under United States copyright law, the copyright can be renewed to after 99 years or after 70 years by a, a by a living family member. So I need to I need to, I just need to make sure. But I agree. This is a wealth of information that, that is coming into my hands uh, from this book because this book cites books from 1500, 1600, 1700. And this book cites boots on the ground research of the people who are at these sites, things that were discovered that are not being published today. So yeah, 100% I'm on board with that. If I find out I'm cleared by the copyrights, I'm going to mass produce that. I'm going to make a copy of it anyway for a PDF and, and put it, put it away to the side because, you know, the closer we get to 2040, I'm not going to give a damn. I'm going to release everything, all these PDFs that I've gathered. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, when, when the, when the world's about to go through something like 2040, copyrights don't mean anything anymore. Infrastructure, infrastructure doesn't govern us anymore. Yeah, but you're right. I'll definitely do that, Charles. Thank you, JJ Recon. I don't know anything about Stargate, but I'm more open to the possibility that there's a gate somewhere located in this world that allows us to go from simulacrum to simulacrum. I'm on board with that idea. We see we see evidence of that in, in older belief systems. I'm not on board with the fact that we can just get in a rocket ship and go, go into space. I'm not on board with that old comical 1905 of science fiction because that's where it came from. The whole idea of rockets and rocket ships and all this idea that NASA got and put together in the whole Nazi rocket program, all that came from science fiction that, that was really popular in like 1905, 1906, 1907. So 
Yeah. Hell, even in 1902, a movie, a silent movie debuted called A Trip to the Moon. Yeah, that was a 1902 movie, A Trip to the Moon. Anybody can Google that. It was also the very first movie they used special effects in. Check it out. Check it out. Okay. Thomas J. Hudson asked, who is your favorite author? All right. I have different favorite authors because they don't write about the same things. Many of you know, I... Ishak Bentov is one of my favorite authors, Stalking the Wild Pendulum and A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness. But I cannot weigh him against my other favorite author, Harold T. Wilkins. Yeah, most of you have never heard of Harold T. Wilkins. Harold T. Wilkins wrote all about the Phoenix Phenomenon and all the stuff, but he never called it the Phoenix Phenomenon. But he wrote all about the Ogaijin Deluge, all about the Great Flood, and he Sykes traditions that I have not found anywhere else. He wrote in the 1940s and 50s. His name is Harold T. Wilkins. His books are fascinating. But he writes, I mean, he was he was quoting so many authors for which we don't have any of the books today. But until so Harold T. Wilkins is awesome. And he was writing about the red fallout and how the sun darkens and these earthquakes and all these civilizations in ancient times that were totally destroyed. And he cites dozens of Native American traditions that were perfectly perfect memories of Phoenix phenomenon at different times. Harold T. Wilkins is my favorite author when it comes to uh, history and all that. Then I have, uh, I mean, I, ha I have other ones. I can't remember his first name, uh, Busenbark. He wrote uh, Sex Symbols and the Stars, another fantastic book on things that you just can't find written about today. Yeah, I have them. But uh, that's two hours and 11 minutes. I haven't had an internet break. I've answered a bunch of questions, but you know what? Our next live q and I'll answer a lot more. But I think my video was over for the day. I need to go back to my other studio and sit with Matt and try to figure out uh, how to use this OBS system before our next live. But before our next live, I got another interesting video coming your way. Thank you, guys. Thank you, moderators. Hey, Bamba Bash. Christine Mose, I really appreciate your support. Appreciate your help. I appreciate the smash. I'm smashing the like button. I'm glad we had uh, 1,600 people, 1,700 people in the chat. And I thank you guys for following me over here, even though the original studio video collapsed. It's all good. Oh, I see all that love in the chat. And always, guys, you know I'm going to always thank my haters because you're making me great. Break free or die trying, my friends. That's what it's all about.